No? No? Okay, once again, um, Wade Rodgers, the manager of the San Jose Cattle Company. Yay! Okay, uh, as some of these up front, we were just talking, I want you guys to realize, first of all, that you're witnessing a rare occurrence. And that's me talking in public. I'm not a public speaker. And I wanna I wanna start right up front in saying that uh, we're gonna get through this. Um, I hope you're gonna learn. I think we'll get to learn what you wanna learn. But we may do it, we may be bouncing around a lot because I'm not very organized. <laughs> so anyway. Um, well first of all, uh, I just thought I'd start out telling y'all just a hair about myself so you understand that part of it, which is not what you're here for, but anyway, I'll take just seconds to do it. Uh, I grew up on a ranch in southern Gonzales County, uh, where my family's ranched for almost 200 years now. And uh, my great-great-grandfather actually went up the Chisholm Trail five times. Uh, the other side of my family were Pony Express riders, so I have a long line of, I guess, ranchers and post office people but uh, <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> they just had to ride horses to do it back then i guess but uh anyway so growing up on that ranch there my family has about three thousand acres and uh and i grew up there and by the time i was about 10 years old that three thousand acres was a pretty small place i mean i had every nook and cranny figured out and i always thought i want to go manage a big ranch somewhere and uh so I uh, graduated high school, and at that time, the management of wildlife, as some of you may know or not know, um, in the private sector, on private ranches, was just kind of an up-and-coming thing. Some of the forefront ranches had a wildlife manager, but, but uh, you know, people just kind of ran their livestock, and the wildlife were just there, you know, and somewhere there in the 70s, it got to be a bigger deal that you can actually manage deer and certain things. And, and so by the time I came along, I thought, well, shoot, if I can learn more about wildlife, I already feel like I know what there is to know about raising cows. Um, we also raised chickens for Holly Farms back in the old days and turned into Tyson today, so my family still does that. So uh, I thought, well, shoot, if I can put these two things together, maybe I can go manage a big ranch somewhere in Texas. And so, it was the name of your family's ranch. It's the Ruddock Ranch. It's my last name, yes sir. And uh, and so anyway, I I, uh, I went on to Texas A&M University. Uh, so I went on to Texas A&M University and uh, got a degree in wildlife ecology and management, and uh, graduated in the summer of '93. Got out and. Ended up coming to work straight out of college within about two months on the San Jose Island for San Jose Cattle Company. Um, so I started there in, in, in 93, late summer, early winter. Um, and at that time, I took on a position as just a ranch hand. Um, I was bottom floor. I mean, I built fence and dug ditches and worked on roads and fed cows and stuff like that. Um, all my college classmates made fun of me because they were sitting at home waiting on a management position somewhere. And uh, anyway, I got fortunate within about six months I, they put me as the wildlife manager of the island. Um, not long after that, I became the ranch foreman, did that for many years. And then uh, when our general manager retired here just a few years ago, I took over that position. And so that's a little bit about me. Um, I've, uh, you know, I've seen it from the ground up, and I think that's the only way to really do something right. You got to know what your people below you are dealing with every day to really understand how to manage the place. That's my personal opinion, and, and, and I feel like it's, it's the way to do it. Um, so anyway, I, I guess now I want to give a little disclaimer because uh, and talk a little bit about the Bass family. Um, First of all, there may be some things that I that I don't talk about today. There may be some things that you guys ask me questions about, which I encourage questions when we're done. Uh, but I've got to respect their privacy. Uh, they 
they trust me to take care of their business and their stuff and so I kind of I treat it like it's mine so I kind of draw the line they might tell you more if they were here but I got to draw a line somewhere where I feel comfortable and, and so we all like our privacy and I think everybody understands that um, so forgive me if I don't answer a question fully or something um, and then secondly just to talk about that family a little probably all of you guys here uh, know of them in some way shape or form and uh, I get asked all the time what what you like to work for people like them um, it's the greatest thing that, that I'll ever do in my life I don't care what comes after if anything does um, I'm as proud of that family as I am of my kids and uh, it just, you know, it shakes me up to think about how they help um, not only us as employees, but the community, you know, many communities and towns and cities around the United States and all that they do. And I'm proud of them. Um, I'm proud to be working for them. So, uh, anyway. <laughs> um, so, I guess from here, uh, like I say, I'm not very organized, so uh, y'all bear with me. We will make it through this um, as long as I can figure out what button to push. Um, the first thing I want to do is, is I want to talk about, um, I guess before we even start out with this wildlife stuff, let's just talk about the island itself. So I get asked all the time, you know, what's out there? What do you do out there? And so what's out there um, is a 33,000 acre barrier island, like I say, I'm not telling you guys anything you don't know, it's the entire eastern land boundary of Aransas County. Uh, runs from Calhoun County to the northeast, down to uh, the Ship Channel on the south. And, uh, and it's a cattle working ranch. Um, we run cattle out there. But our, but our primary goal, and this is another thing I like about the Bass family is, our primary above all else is to maintain that island as a healthy barrier island natural ecosystem that's that's what our goal is we have cattle there because cattle are one of the primary tools to manage a piece of land in my opinion um, and i'm pretty biased about that if somebody wants to argue that we'll probably have a pretty big debate um, and uh and so it's san jose cattle company but it's a barrier island is what it is and that's what we manage for the cattle are our best tool for that along with fire um, and so you know as an island it comes like you can see i just put some pictures here to show some margin of some of our stuff onto the island it's it's obviously has its logistical nightmares you know i mean it when i thought about well i want to manage a big ranch when i was that big i never thought it was going to be an island and <laughs> and, uh, and it's it's, it's a tough situation, you know, when everything you get has to go by boat or by plane to get there, it's, it makes it logistically very difficult. But on the other hand, it makes it unique in, in what it is. So, you know, when you think about an island like that, um, I have my opinions and I've read books that kind of flow with me on, on how those islands, these islands, barrier islands probably farm once upon a time and you know just a real fast forward deal, you know, I see a a sandbar that formed out there once upon a time and began to rise and rise and before long a little backbone popped up above there of sand and something started growing there, some spartina or something, and then it just grew and it grew and it grew and obviously that took a long, long time. But those islands farmed I feel like that's how they form. Just from what's in the ground, what you can dig up and find there, I think I think that they form that way as a sand spit. Um, and so then plants had to be upland plants. Once it got high enough, then you had to have upland species of plants begin to take hold. And as they did that, you know, you're going to have certain species that are super hardy. They can handle that environment out there. I mean, that's a hostile environment out there. Very hostile. Um, you know, you get pounded by by sandblasted every day, most all days, from the winds blowing, which we know it does here most of the time. Um, any night when the wind's blowing over about 15 at nighttime, 
when the waves in the Gulf are big, you have salt spray that's going over the island. And during the daytime, it gets evaporated before it gets deposited on the land. But at nighttime, that salt spray makes it over the island and sets on the grass. <clears throat> Everything that lives out there, it's just like you take a pump spray or salt water and squirt it. So in the morning, if you go out there and what's, if it's been windy and it looks like dew, you go over and touch that leaf and lick it in salt water. So those plants have to be tough enough to not get burnt by salt water like that. They have to get tough enough to handle, you know, a hurricane, overwash, salt water coming over the rock while and depositing and setting on it and soaking in. So it's it's a really harsh environment. It takes only a few really tough species can manage that. And and it's the same thing with the wildlife that found its way into the island. Um, you know, we so we have some we have some species, for instance, snakes. Um, we've got I was going to try to I'll push that too many times too fast. We have several species of snakes, but not near as many as you have here. You know, we have the speckled king snake, which I had a picture of in the beginning. Uh, Cottonmouth water moccasins, coach whips. That's one eating a rat over there. It's not a very good, good picture of it. But, uh, but uh, we have two types of rattlesnakes, both the regular diamondback and what we call a pygmy out there, which is a mastasagua, I think is the correct, the correct name. Uh, but but not your other. We have coyotes. That's a dead longhorn with a pack of coyotes feeding on it right there. Um, we have you know jackrabbits, but we don't have any cottontails. We have um, of course that's a peregrine falcon sitting on the beach. I just thought that was neat. Um, we, the wild turkeys were actually brought into these islands. They they weren't native out there. We have to build roost structures for them to roost on. They actually do well, but you have to provide them roost. Um, there's a badger in the bottom corner. Um, we have badgers. We don't have we don't have possums. We have coons. Lots of coons. We don't have skunks. We don't have armadillos. Um, so many things you have over here, we just don't have over there. And I think what it amounts to is, oh, here's a wild white quail. We have a lot of quail. Um, the hurricane hurt them pretty bad. We had a lot of quail. We're trying to recover. We have. Lots of white tailed deer, um, but you know we have no bobcats, which you have here. Obviously, we have no squirrels, we have no trees. So there's just a, <laughs> there's there's species that have that have made it out there, and others that haven't. And sometimes you'll see an odd one of something that you've never seen before, but you don't ever know how they got there, and you never see it again. It's interesting how it can happen sometimes. I don't know if they swim out there from somewhere. <laughs> Die because they can't handle it or what? But what about hogs? We do have a lot of hogs. I was going to fail to mention that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have plenty of hogs. Yes, we do. Um, and so the the animals have adapted that live there, and the ones that live there do very very well. Um, and then that kind of leads in while we're talking about life. It kind of lead, leads into the the people that. That work on these islands and spend a lot of time out there. Um, you know, it's not so much today. I know Mr. Brunner he was talking here a while back, and you know, when in the history of those people that lived on those barrier islands, that's their home. When they didn't have all the comforts of home, that was a tough lot, I'll guarantee you, back in those days. Um, but today, it's still, to in a sense, um, Everybody can't handle it because, especially the folks that live out there a lot of the time, because, you know, there's, it's just your small little group of people. And there's no, I hired a guy one time, and boy, he was a cowboy and he wanted to go be a ranch hand, and he got out there and he was there for about two weeks, and that was going to be his home. We offered him room and board and everything. And he came to me and said, Wait, I can't handle this. I said, What do you mean you can't handle it? He said, I'm too alone now. He said, it's just too lonely. There's there's no there's no no people out. I mean, other than our little group, and then on the weekends there's just one or two of us. He said, I can't I can't do this. I gotta be able to jump in the car and go to Waterford or go to the movies or I can't I can't do that. And you know it's it's one thing that you, know, you can sit here and you know, I heard some giggles and all. It's one thing to, to sit here and think about it, but you go actually live it. And if you're not a person who's a solitary person. It is, it is a hard, hard life, and I could imagine it would have been a hard life. Uh, and the other thing really unique I, about, you know, our employees out there, um, 
is the, you know, you got to imagine that island, it's not like when you go to take supplies to your house, where, you know, you can put them in the bed of your truck or in your car. Well, you have to realize on that island, we're running a small community. We have a water work system that we handle ourselves, we provide our water. We have to provide our own power. I mean, those little things where you walk into your house and you flip the switch or you open the faucet and you have power of water. We have to, from the very ground, we have to create the fuel to power the generators, to power the headquarters, and have the men that can work on all those things and keep it going. We have to get the water out of the ground, pump to big storage facilities, have pumps, have some RO systems on some of that for certain uses and guys that can work on every bit of that stuff. We're 100% we're self-sustained um, for the most part. It's just normal day-to-day -day living. I mean, a big something we may have a contractor coming. But. So when you start talking about running a small community, um, it takes a lot of people to wear a lot of different hats to do that. And in our case, you know, it makes no sense to hire over half employed over 15 or 20 people. So that means every one of them has to do multiple jobs. It's not like, you know, here where you have somebody that's a plumber or an electrician. There, they're the plumber, the electrician, the carpenter, the yard man, and the something else, you know. Um, and you find those, those good points about each person. You may hire that person because they're a great carpenter, but then you find that, man, maybe they can milk a cow real good, you know, so to speak. And, and so you, you find things for they, that they're good at, that they can help you with. And so, um, and so, for instance, in the morning, when when we head to the island, um, most folks live over here on the mainland, so there's always a small handful that are over there at all times, but most folks live over here. Go to our boat house south of Rockport down there and get on a couple of boats and head across the island. And you know, on that boat, let, on those couple of boats, let's say there's you know 15 or 20 people. Well, we've got you know there's there's boat captains, there's deckhands, there's chefs, <laughs> there's butlers, there's maids, there's cooks, there's electricians, there's plumbers, there's mechanics, there's biologists. There's veterinarians, there's ranchers, farmers. I mean, you go down the line, everything you have over, there, over here, we do ourselves. You know, there's gardening, there's landscape specialists. There's, there's specialists in just about every field. But they, we've had to teach ourselves to do those things. You know, there's, there's pilots. We have one of our ex-pilots back here in the back. You know, there's, you know, just a vast array of people, and just a handful of people, a vast array of jobs that are performed, and so. We've got to be self-sufficient, um, and I'm really proud to have the folks that we have because every one of them has their has their spot and is very helpful. So, as we move on uh, through this wildlife deal, um, I think what we'll do here is let's talk a little bit about the cattle out there. Um, so, once again, it, we're trying to manage a barrier island. To, to be the best barrier island in the world. That's, that's my goal. And so one of our best tools for that is cattle. And the reason for that is, is they're employees that also make money for you. And so you can't get much better than an employee that you can sell when you're done with them to make some money. <laughs> so, so, we, we have, uh, so here you're seeing some photographs of some longhorns. Um, kind of some interesting history on those. Um, you know, back in the, I don't know my dates well, but I bet you it was probably in the 40s or 50s. Um, a lot more European cattle were being brought, maybe even the 30s and 40s, into the U.S. And because folks found that a lot of these European breeds, the, that they were just more efficient at producing beef. The Longhorns are really thin animals that evolved here in southern Texas and Mexico um, to survive. You know, they were long-legged and could run like the wind, get away from predators, and 
whatever have you. And so they don't grow the quality, not only the quality, but the amount of beef that some of these other breeds do. So, <clears throat> so the Longhorn was, people were, as they were slaughtering them, they weren't replacing them because there was no need to, you had better livestock. And so <clears throat> Sid Richardson, who, uh, you know, was the, the bass predecessor that, that bought the island, um, he and a few buddies of his decided, you know what, there's going to be so few of these, we're going to save, we're going to try to save this breed. So they went out and bought a small herd of longhorns. The first place they took them was to San Jose Island while they were trying to figure out where they were going to put them somewhere in the States here. And I think, I think that herd then got moved to Fort McCabot or somewhere up in, in North Texas. Um, but the interesting thing about Longhorn, they brought this breed, or bought this herd, moving them to the island. Well, one of the guys involved in that was a fellow named J. Frank Doby. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever read any books by J. Frank Doby, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it. If you're here wanting to know something about history and about Texas history, you need to read J. Frank Doby's stuff. And, and the one you might want to start with is called The Longhorns because it was written while he lived on San Jose Island with those Longhorns. That's where he wrote the book. And uh, not only is it really neat information about the Longhorn breed, but it's also great historical information about old-time Texas back in the day. And I'm talking about back when the long, how it tells about how a longhorn came to be a breed of animal. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, so that was a neat deal. And the other, the other cattle that would run out there are Santa Gertrudis cattle, which the Santa Gertrudis breed came from, the, was originated on the King Ranch. And, uh, and they were developed to be a breed that could withstand our environment down here, uh, right along the coastal prairie, you know, the parasites and mosquitoes and temperatures and no shade anywhere. You've got to stand out in the sun all the time. I mean, out there, unlike here, we don't have shade trees on the island. It's, it's prairie. Um, we have a few thickets up on the far north end and moths, but, but there's no shade trees to speak of. Um, and so and so we run Santa Gertrude's cattle out there. They've been out there since... Um, since Sid Richardson's early days, he bought and, and upgraded and bred Santa Gertrude's cattle, and we maintain them just kind of as an heirloom. Um, so, <clears throat> the reason that cattle are so beneficial and that we use them to maintain this island is that, especially in sandy country, not so much in hard packed clay, but in sandy country, when the ground gets disturbed, it tends to grow a lot of variety of plants. And so, not only you think of a cow going out there, they're, they're just eating grass, you might think, well, they're just trying to get the grass down. Well, that's part of it. But the other thing is, every time that animal takes a step, it knocks up a little divot of sand. And when it does that, it chops, creates a little old divot, <clears throat> bears up some ground a lot of times. And then what happens is you get a lot of different species of plants growing up. And diversity is the key to maintaining a, a good ecosystem. You know, I've got, I can, I'm kind of getting off track here, but I'm going to go down here anyway and show you all a couple of pictures. So here's, just look the way you want to. here's an example right here of what I'm talking about if I can get back. There's two photographs. <clears throat> this area right here hasn't been burned or grazed in at least 20 years. I'll bet you if you got on your hands and knees, you might find three species of plants growing there. That picture gets burned on a three-year rotation and gets grazed. Now, <clears throat> when you see all that different color in there, that's meaning that obviously there's different plants growing there, and there's a bunch more than what you can't see. There's probably 20 different species in that photograph. <clears throat> so, that's what, and the majority of that, the, the fire cleans this up, and then the cattle tromping and stomping creates that. <clears throat> and so, a lot of folks think, you know, what's, so you're managing an island and you want to manage it for a natural ecosystem, well, why do you, why do you go to this trouble running cattle on there, you know, 
burning. Why don't you just let it just sit there and do its thing? Um, let it just be whatever it is. But my opinion is that that way Ruddock's heart headed, and my opinion is that over there is better than this over here. It's kind of like, imagine if you go to a buffet restaurant. You got one right here. These two buffet restaurants are both the same quality food. One of them has a few things, and this one over here has a lot of choices. Which one do you think is going to have more cars in the parking lot? It's going to be the one with a whole lot of choices. That's just the way things work. So in our case, you know, we just come off the spring migration, and we're still in it of these birds coming north. <clears throat> when those birds are coming across, all these migrants are coming across these pretty little old birds, are coming across that gulf. And they see land, you got to imagine, I mean, it's like that gas station that you're coming, you've been needing to go to the bathroom for a long time. <laughs> it's like, please get, you know, they come diving out of that air, they got, they're out of fuel. They need something to eat right now, they need somewhere to rest really bad. <clears throat> well, when you have a situation like this, there's somewhere to rest. <clears throat> but I'll assure you, there's not much to eat out there because there's no... There's no seed base, because these, these grasses don't have seeds that are of any count in particular grass there. Um, there's not enough flowers and whatnot to draw in seed uh, insects for the insect eaters. So this is, might as well just about be a parking lot. That right there, there'll be birds just flowing through there like grasshoppers, because there's seeds to eat, there's bugs to eat, there's nectar there. Um, there's hummingbirds, they get their fuel out of that. I mean, so that's that's what we strive for is, is habitat diversity. And <clears throat> the other thing while I'm while I'm kind of on this subject that I'd like to tell you all a little about is the fire side of things. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now this picture, <clears throat> this area in the fort, you can kind of see a half a kind of a ring here. Um, Inside here, out of the frame, there's a bush or something like this. There's probably a bush in here. And we've made a ring around it in order to protect that bush from fire. Well, that ring is made with a plow or a disc behind the tractor. And at the time we burned, that was bare sand. <clears throat> That's what keeps that from getting burned up. We put a tremendous amount of resources into creating fire breaks protecting things like the few bushes that we want to have. We'll get onto this prairie deal in a minute. Uh, we do select to have a few bushes out there because they are helpful, but keep them limited. As you see in that picture, there's not many bushes in that picture. I think there's that one. Um, <clears throat> but uh, So we plow around every bush. We start that back in September. Guys on the tractor for 60 days straight. Never get off of it. I mean, get off of it and sleep, but <laughs> plowing and plowing and plowing and prepping that. All the fuel and manpower. Usually, a lot of times, there may be two guys on two tractors. And get all that stuff ready so that whenever burn, because we, we can only burn when the winds are certain directions so we don't smoke you guys out. Everything has to be perfect. So when the window opens, we need to have as many places ready to go as possible so we can burn one out and jump in it and burn it out. And we burn small areas. Um, I don't believe in burning two or three thousand acre chunks at a time. We burn 30, 40, 50 acre chunks, maybe a hundred acres if it's a certain situation. But I believe in checkerboard. Burn one and leave one, and burn one and leave one. That way you have a lot of edge. You've got burnt ground and, and then different ages of, of uh, regrowth coming back from last year, the year before you burn. So, this area here it goes to show you what inside there, that's the tall rank, very few plants, of, of, uh, very few, a lot of plants, but very few, very little diversity. Then you have that ring around there where you see some silver leaf sunflowers and some, um, some other flowers growing in there. <clears throat> that creates a, about a 20 foot wide ring around there that has that diversity. And then this out here was burnt. All this outside was burnt two or three months before this photograph was taken. So then you have a bunch of different, you can kind of see the shades, you can see what's going on. There's a lot of different things going on there. <clears throat> and so 
So that's how we create the diversity. That's how we provide a place not only for our native resident wildlife, but for all these other birds that come through that really need that island uh, to save their lives so they can move on throughout their journey. Uh, <clears throat> this is another situation with, you know, shows you a windmill with some bushes there around it. Um, a lot of times, we, as I said, we do transplant a few bushes. Um, we actually spend, we probably spend 30 days every winter at the right time transplanting bushes from areas where we have a few more, just little seedlings into areas where we need to have, you know, native bushes of different kinds. Um, and then we, of course, we need to water them, go back weekly and water them, do everything we need to do, try to rinse their leaves off during that time so they till their roots get established and they get toughened up. Um, but this is a this is a typical situation of setup we have out there. Um, you know <coughs> cattle, cattle use it, but this is set up for wildlife. I mean we have there's a there's a coral bean there and that's I think that's actually a yoke pond right there. <coughs> Very few yoke ponds actually make it out there. Um, but uh, you know we have a water source um, there is a water trough, big water trough that goes out here in this hole behind the photographer. It's a big water trough. And most times what we do, the water will fill up the cistern. The cistern then keeps a big cement water trough full. And then any excess water that's made goes into a wildlife pond there. So waterfowl and everything that prefers to have water on the ground. So we divide all those situations in one, one setting. And there's 26 or so like that scattered throughout the island. Um, <clears throat> here's a picture of some of our, you know, here's a coral bean, an example of a transplant we did one time. A fence around it to keep the cattle from, because when the mosquitoes get bad, cattle love to get up in them and walk through them and to rub the mosquitoes off, so they'll just stomp them to the ground. <laughs> so we have to fence around every bush. That's a little seedling in that one. You can't even hardly make it out, but that's, you know, a week after we planted that thing, that fence will stay up until it gets established, and then one day we'll hopefully have to expand the fence to make it a lot bigger than that. It's just a temporary, a quickie temporary to see if, if it'll survive, and then we'll build a. Once they get to this point, soon after this, we'll build in a nice kind of a wooden structured fence around that thing where that looks a lot nicer than that. <clears throat> Once again, we plant a lot of coral beans just because they're. They're so beneficial to the hummingbirds. And, and I mean, these are just scattered through 33,000 acre ranch. Um, that way, hummingbirds, orioles coming in, they have places to feed. Um, you know, they they also benefit our um, our native wildlife through shade, you know, thermal help during the heat of the summer. It gives animals something, the small animals, something to get under to get some shade and whatnot. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about that burning <coughs> and how important it is, I don't know if you guys have uh, ever paid attention, but when you drive when you drive north, 35 out of Rockport, um, get through Holiday Beach, and we start coming up on Colossal Creek right there. Um, next time you do that, if you haven't, just start paying attention to both sides of the highway as you're headed north. And you're going to notice on the left side, it's a lot brushier than the right hand side. The right hand side's not as prairie like as it really should be because it's not burning enough, but it's burnt periodically. That's the one thing those two pieces, there are other things different, but the one thing that's causing that is the lack of burning on the left and the burning that is done on the right. And as you work your way up towards 774, it will get more evident. You get up towards Salt Creek. And it's turned into a brush thicket on your left hand side and the right side is much much more open now they're on like the refuge there on the right they're on kind of what i just watching it i'd say a five-year rotation you're going to see there are mesquites there are plants coming up out there they're getting on up this tall they need to hurry up or they're going to get ahead of them you know that's the reason i believe in a three-year because in a three-year rotation You'll never have those little woody plants get over about that tall because the fire will zap them when they're that tall. It'll kill them out, and that's what maintains your coastal prairie for you. Um, just a little something interesting that most of you probably need to do. 
there's a picture of some of the little birds and like I say that, that are in some of our bushes that we do maintain uh, there's a picture of some pooping cranes out in a burn. That was that ground you can kind of see too. You can see some char down here. Um, that was obviously it was wet when it was burnt because it didn't burn off clean. And you can see the little green coming back. So it was probably two or three weeks. This photograph was taken two or three weeks after it burned. And so <coughs> it uh, it's another beneficial use of a burn. You can see the hooping cranes out there. There were sand hills. Well, there's one there. There's more sand hills scattered all around here. And what's so interesting to me about that photograph is, you guys may remember here several years ago when uh, we were in a pretty bad drought and the blue crabs didn't do well and we were panicking about the hurricane. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife mentioned putting some corn feeders out. People that had places out in the Lamar area where cranes came around to maybe help them out in the refuge, I understood, was feeding some corn. <clears throat> the cranes out on the island, until that time, I had, in my 25 odd years, well, at that time it wasn't that many, probably 22 or 3 years there at that time, I had never seen the cranes up into the uplands of the island, the hooping cranes. Uh, that I can recall. But very quickly, I guess out of necessity, they watched the sand hills and they went with the sand hills. And so they came up into the uplands and started feeding. It just almost like you could watch them look at that sand hill, like, what are you doing? The next thing, well, let me try that. And they developed a pattern. And ever since then, those hooping cranes, I guess just from learning that and passing it on to their young. I see them up into our openings uh, on a regular basis since that time. So it was a new feeding strategy they developed and learned from the hooping crane through that time. And obviously the tubers and grubs and whatever all they're getting up there must work for them because they, they do well on them. Um, they still spend, you know, 80% of their time out there in the marshes, but they will come up there and, uh, and do that sort of feeding, which you don't see that often in a lot of places. Um, Here's a <clears throat> talk a little. Well, here's some of some hooping cranes mixed in there for sand hills. You can see. Uh, so I wanted to talk just a minute about uh, about some of the other conservation efforts that we do out there. Uh, we uh, these two photographs. This is a, a baby Aplomato falcon. And this is a nest structure. Uh, we, uh, we have a partnership with the Peregrine Fund and uh, have for many years. And, you know, they reintroduced the Aplomato Falcon a bunch of years ago, um, some on Matagorda, some on Mustang. And uh, they didn't put any on us, but they asked us if they, if they could come put a bunch of nest boxes up and hopefully they'd fill in the middle. And so we did. And uh, prior to the, well, the spring before Harvey, we had seven nesting pairs out there on San Jose Island. Uh, now the hurricane zapped them. I mean, it, we've only had three, we've only confirmed three birds that have returned. So there's not only the seven pair, but there was their offspring that we banded that year. And I can't think off the top of my head how many that was. But, and the, the biologists with the Peregrine Fund, we've about come to the conclusion that it must have killed them. You know, that they're not going to come back. At this point, they're gone. So I think that storm killed them, which it killed. I, I would imagine it did. I can't imagine. I'm, I'm surprised the ones that, that survived. I mean, it was hard on birds, if y'all know. Um, so we had that with Peregrine Fund. And uh, and then uh, <coughs> we also, that's the Ridley's there making a nest I took a picture of. Um, this is a plover, a bandit. You can't see the band on its leg, but a bandit plover. Um, We've had a relationship with the University of Texas Marine Science Institute for about 20 years now. And uh, Tony Amos kind of spearheaded that relationship for them. And, and for that long, at least once a week, during turtle nesting season, twice a week, um, some of the representatives come over to the island and, and go down our beach. And they look at you know marine mammal strandings. There's a sperm whale. That was found dead there on the beach. Uh, they, during nesting season, they look for turtles nesting, gather up their eggs, take it to the hatchery, um, make sure those 
hatchlings get turned back loose into the Gulf. Um, they do studies on trash, debris, you know, where does this milk jug come from and where does that come from? They do, uh, they do really neat stuff on, um, on the growth and erosion of the Gulf, Gulf beachfront, which is quite amazing. Um, you know, we, I watched in my time there, I watched the island grow out into the Gulf um, about 80 yards. Um, we had a cabana on the beach that was completely covered by sand dunes and there were dunes out even short, um, water side of them. And, uh, but that one night, Pearl Harvey took all that back, just cut it off. I think I've got a photograph here of that. Um, yeah, that's, that's what our beach looked like after Harvey. Um, it just, and that's, as you can see, tall on that truck. Um, it, uh, it really took a lot of sand away. I mean, it was impressive uh, how much sand it took away. I mean, there was, like I said, there was probably, of dunes like this, there was probably 50 yards of dunes like that. That, it, that tall that it took away. Um, and so uh, we're starting over again. But uh, but it's already growing fast. You you can't even recognize it from that photograph today. It's absolutely unbelievable. Uh, that was I just threw in there. That's a corner of a sheet of plywood stuck in a palm tree. That uh, it's about nine inches in that tree where it blew that sheet of plywood off the window and stuck in that tree like an axe and just embedded it, and broke the plywood off. Um, Wait, don't you think the sand went back out the sand? <coughs> And so if it's replenishing the... I would think it would have to, Jerry. I can't imagine. It's not up on the land. Right. Yeah, it had to go. And, and I think, it, you know, it probably didn't go very far. It probably deposited and it'll, it'll build back. You would think so. It'd be interesting to know if the, if, the, if it was shallower out there for a ways, you know, now. Which you, it found a... Uh, this, these are a couple of photographs. Here's an idea after the storm. It's the same ship before the storm. Now that was probably six or eight months before the storm. I mean, it quite tore it down. You can see how it was, half of it was up in the beginning of the sand dunes. Well, here it is today. It's, this is taken from the opposite side. I took that photograph from over there. Um, but uh, as you can tell how far it is up here to the dunes now, it just gives you an idea of, uh, of how much erosion, and it just tore the top of it off. And, Drove it off out there and probably buried it as well. Did anybody stay out on that? I did. <laughs> no, I sent everybody else out there. Oh my gosh. <laughs> would you do it again? I would. Yeah. I uh, Where I was at, I felt pretty comfortable. And uh, I think I would. I, was it built for that purpose? It was. It was built with that in mind. I mean, the homes made it on Shell Creek whole thing and uh, it was built with storms in mind you know I probably to answer that question a little more fully I probably if they wouldn't have been saying when I sent everybody home because it takes us so much time out there because you got to get these boats to town they're not just like little boats you can put on the trailer you got to really drag them out with travel boys and stuff so it takes like a day to get all our boats out of the water and anchored down up on land and cinch down and stuff so you have to Kind of make a decision who's going to stay or not about a, about two days in advance because then you know you got to have people time to go take care of their own stuff so we we usually start getting stuff ready and then about two days in advance you know we decide okay we're we're out of here or not and then uh so i whenever i told everybody to go away it was going to be a category two at that time and they left me and uh and i'm uh Part of the reason I stayed to begin with was they were talking about that storm linger and doing that little doodad it did and stay. Well, I just knew it was going to take a long time for us to get get feet on the ground back out there and see how things work. And there's a lot, of, a lot of animals and stuff that you can't, you just can't load all that stuff up every time you think there's a storm. Storm's here, you know, and so you want to get back and check on those things. And so I thought, well, you know, it's only going to be a category two. I'll just stay here. That way, I don't have to panic, try to figure out if the wind's still blowing hard, we can't use those travel points to get our boats back in the water. I'll be here. Well, then it turned into that. So, I don't know. If it, if I knew it was going to be a four and it was going to blow through, whoosh, real fast, or if it could get back, then I might be. But not if, it, if I think it's going to take several days. I'll just stay. Okay. Thank you. 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 Th
There's a picture of our beach just last week, gives you an idea. And the reason I wanted to show this is y'all can see all that debris and trash. And there's lots of trash. There's a Sprite bottle and there's some kind of jar with a lid on it here. There's an old can there. There's all kinds of plastic junk and old buoy. I mean, and you really get there and start looking, there is trash like you would believe. It almost makes you feel sick to your stomach when you see all that stuff. But what I wanted to tell you all about this, um, number one, to try to go to the bat for the trash a little bit. Makes me feel better anyway. Our beach is proven through these scientists that our beach grows super fast compared to beaches that are groomed all the time. Because what happens is quite obvious. I mean, I watch it happen every day. You get a, you get a, you know, a, a milk crate or something washed in out there, or a hard hat, and it gets deposited there. Well, that blowing sand's going to hit it. It's, it's going to stop sand, and the sand's going to build up over top of it, and then it's going to start falling over back. Before long, if you go down there and you see a little hump of sand that tall, you just peel off the top, and there's some kind of piece of junk underneath there. Well, that starts forming a little sand bin. Pretty quick, it grows a plant of some kind on the top. That grows another plant that gets taller and higher and bigger. And so our beach is very aggressive at growing because of, and Matagord is the same, uh, because they don't clean up theirs. But Mustang, the other thing that's interesting is, so these guys that do these UTMSI studies, they run Mustang and North Padre as well. They tell me, for instance, with the, um, a lot of our key bird species, you know, red knots, the, the plovers, um, our beach is, well, the other day, to kind of quote the fellow bird ornithologist, he said, he said, San Jose Island is by far the healthiest beach that we run up and down for those birds. He said, the species like the Wilson's plover, for instance, that are everywhere on San Jose during their migratory period are a ghost on Mustang Island today. And he said the reason for that is, is all this organic matter that you see here. And he said what happens is that organic matter feeds into the sand, puts organic matter into that, and that's what allows the, mic the little microorganisms that these birds feed on in the sand to grow and live there. And so they stare, basically they sterilize their beach and they pick up all that sargassum, all these reeds and sticks and limbs and all that stuff. They're sterilizing their beach of organic matter. And so, uh, so that's, a, that's a pretty, it's a good thing about it. You know, the trash, once again, I, I wish there wasn't so much of it, but the really interesting thing that you would never imagine is, is I'll promise you, even though that buoy is probably 18 inches tall the way it lays there, that in probably 60 days, if not for sure by 90, it'll be covered, it'll be gone. All that stuff you see here, this little stuff will be gone in 45 days. There'll be some more get washed up, but that stuff will be covered and gone. Um, so it just, the beach consumes it, and that's how it, grows, that's how it lives. You know, that, that Gulf beach is, is like a, natural land evolution and triple fast forward. I mean, it's amazing to sit down. I mean, you can almost watch it grow down there, you know. Any place where you can walk through sand when it's windy and come back an hour later and you can't see your footprints. I mean, that's growing. That's that's a dynamic system right there. And uh, so it's really cool to watch that, to watch that grow. Uh, anyway, I... Uh, I probably bored y'all enough. I just thought that was a pretty cool picture. Uh, took that off the island uh, kind of as a final end deal. But uh, if y'all have any questions, I'll, I'll do my best to answer. As part of your management of the ranch, do you have it subdivided into pastures with fences? Yes, sir. And how big a deal is your fence maintenance program? It's an absolute nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that same salt dude that I was talking about just does it horrendous number on the fencing but it's real interesting on the so most of our fences run kind of across the island uh, from gulf to bay and as you get close to the gulf um within two or three hundred yards of the gulf a typical brand of barbed wire will last you know 
maybe two years. Wow. You know, something you'd put up inland that would last for 50 years, uh, maybe two years. As you get over the sand dunes on the back side of them, it probably jumps to five or six years. <clears throat> Just having the sand dunes blocking a little bit of that overspray. And then as you get out, not necessarily right out on the mud flats because it gets a, not near as bad as on the Gulf, it gets a little rough again, but as you get about, you know, a mile from, you can get about a mile from the Gulf. You might get 10 years out of a strand of barbed wire. And it's like that with all our equipment. <laughs> Everything out there. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how fast stuff. I mean, you think stuff for us here on the main bank. You get out there, it's just a whole new level. Yes, sir. Along that same subject, I lived on Key Allegro at a boathouse. I, I had a little shop of tools in it. I mean, every winter came along, those tools would just be absolutely rusted, you know. And I had to try to cover them up. Now, I can't imagine what happens over there on the island in your maintenance. It's terrible. It's absolutely horrible. I mean, I can't even... You know, really and truly, our, the only way to get by is, is anything you can get. And that's when I learned there's different types of stainless steel. <laughs> I learned, there's stainless steel, and there's stainless steel, and there's stainless steel. Right. you got to get the best one. Um, but it's just, it's terrible. It's terrible. Yeah. 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 You got to get the best one. Um, or uh, really well hot dip galvanized, you know. Um, anything you can get that way. I mean, trailers that we have built, we'll just take the trouble of having hot dip galvanized, you know. Buy aluminum, anything you can. But yeah, the tools, you gotta keep them, you just almost have to keep them in a climatized environment. That's about all there is to it. Yes, ma'am, I think she has. I wondered how the Longhorns fared during Harvey. They did really well. <clears throat> um, matter of fact, I have yet to, so we run a lot of cattle, and it's hard to keep up with every last one of them when you've got, you know, over a thousand head of cattle. But, I have yet to prove that I've lost one of them, that even one of them vanished. Now, it would not surprise me. Um, I've had some tales, some, some boys told me that they found a small group of them dead that were drowned up there that they thought were ours, but I hadn't seen any proof of it yet. I hadn't seen any photographs. I asked them to please give me proof. Where is it? And I have yet to see that. But, uh, but I will tell you one thing that was very interesting that I'll never forget. Uh, when I was out there, and uh, just that evening, just before it was fixing to get rough enough, I needed to get inside. I was riding around checking on the last few things. And I noticed that every pasture of cattle I went by, they were in the southwest corner of that pasture, just jammed up in the southwest corner. And I thought, well, man, that's, that's interesting. I mean, you know, I watch cattle all the time, and they usually... You know, they'll do things like that with the weather, but I thought, why are they in the southwest corner? <clears throat> and I walked into the house 20 minutes later and thought I better get inside, and I turned on the TV, and as soon as I clicked it on the weather, the weatherman said, anybody that's left in the Rockport area needs to head southwest. <laughs> <laughs> so they obviously knew it's almost like they knew wherever that storm I mean it was getting close by then and that's where you know I think the weatherman thought the safest direction to get, get on by it and get past that end of it uh, so they but the cattle knew that you know and, and I've always been interested in how animals they, they know a lot of things so kind of way but uh, they did good this man uh, with all of those factors involved, what's the advantage of running cattle out there? Oh. <clears throat> well, the, the advantage is, of, like I was talking earlier, is creating a diverse habitat. Once again, the photographs that I showed, uh, yeah. so let me go back to these real quick because that's pretty well makes the statement. Uh, but I guess what I'm asking, does that outweigh all of the, the costs? Prohibitive <coughs> disadvantages. So, so yes, um, I'm not gonna find it. It is so important to the family to keep that island. There it goes again. <laughs> so that this photograph right here, it's so important to them that we maintain that island as as perfect of an environment for all the wildlife as we can. 
And we are convinced that that is better than that. If we didn't have cattle, it would look like this. It's guaranteed. And so the family feels like it is everything they do out there is for nothing more than feeling good inside that they're taking care of that system out there. There is no reason to spend. It makes no monetary sense whatsoever to go to the trouble to run cattle out there on that island or anything else. Or you know, why not just let it just sit here and be this and enjoy whatever you can. I mean, that's what <clears throat> that's what Matagorda Island looks like. Um, that's what, I just come off North Padre from a deal the other day, that's what it looks like. But they want it to be better than that. And uh, so that's the reason they spend so much, we spend so much, because all the other stuff, like I, you know, one thing I didn't go into, I know I talked a lot about some things, but I didn't even get into a lot of what we do on the island. I mean, every day, there's, there are mechanics, cowboys, and all these people that are working on, you know, this tremendous amount of stuff that has to be upkept in order to keep that place looking like that. But all those other jobs, you know, the, 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 the ecology side is the only thing that is really a position that that's the main position is the biology the side of taking care of the place and all those other positions are backup they're just helping helping us take care of that wild system that's you know whether it's a mechanic working on a tractor so we can plow fire breaks whether it's a cook cooking for us so we have something to eat so we can get back out there and do that you know whether it's an electrician working on a air condition in a house so that the guys that live there that go take care of the wild, wild side of things have a place to sleep, you know. It's all just money spent towards them taking care of it. And that's what they do. They own ranches all around the nation. And that's their goal is to keep every one of them in kind of a different ecosystem. And uh, they're just proud to keep big, big properties as a whole. And they don't mind spending a lot of money on to keep them good. Yes, ma'am. Do you have a lot of horses out there? We have a handful of horses. Um, nowadays, with the advent of the, of the helicopters <laughs> and ATVs and such, um, we don't use them near as much as in the past. But we do have a few when they're needed. Yes, ma'am. Wait, one thing that, that people may or may not understand, but that barrier island, they call it a barrier island for a very important reason that Harvey would have done a tremendous amount of more damage to the mainland here had it not been for that island. And the work that y'all are doing out there, maintaining the fort dune structure, and those are the tallest fort dunes along the, the barrier uh, string of islands, is that protects the mainland right here from from tidal surges. And, and it's a real blessing to this, uh, this community here in particular that y'all are out there doing that. We couldn't, we couldn't raise enough tax dollars to do what y'all are out there doing. <laughs> exactly. No, I agree. You know, and it's like my dad always told me. He said, uh, he said, don't ever brag on your kids or your dogs. And uh, but I feel like I can brag on. He didn't tell me not don't brag on the people I work for. Um, <laughs> that's absolutely right, Mr. Perry Bass. Back in the day, he always told me. He said, Wade. He said, whatever you do, do not damage those sand dunes. He said, don't overgraze, you gotta maintain this cow herd. That's the most sensitive part of the whole deal. So we we can't necessarily keep our inland country just perfect because we gotta watch the sand dunes. That's your indicator is your sand dunes. You gotta back off. You never let a fire run through the sand dunes. I'm very disappointed. I um, hope I don't offend anybody here, but uh, I'm very disappointed in the, in the wildlife refuge because they've been burning through their dunes the last 10 years or so. They just let the fire go to the Gulf. And it's real interesting, I was flying over it the other day, and I'd love to get down there and measure those dunes. Those dunes are, I mean, I spent a bunch of time over there probably 15 years ago on the ground. And I know those dunes have shrunk by, had, had, it's noticeable from the air they've shrunk, they've blown off. As they burn them in their bare sand, they glow off, you know? And so, uh, and so it's it's, it's kind of depressing to see them shrinking their dunes by letting fire run through them. But it's 
it saves money. They don't have to run a fire break along the back side of the dunes. They don't have to back burn by. I mean, it takes a lot of time and effort and money to do those things. So, yes, ma'am, I know you have. Um, you said, um, you mentioned a little bit about farming. So what kind of farming do you do? <clears throat> well, when I said about farming, we don't really do any kind of farming per se like you'd be thinking about. It's more of um, like running farm equipment like for our fire breaks and such as that. We don't do any farm. We have a few wildlife food plots that we plant, but a, but a 10 acre food plot is about the extent of our farm. Okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I, I did some research on the posters in the front room, a whole lot on Richardson, Bass, Murchison, all of that. And they have buffalo on the island at, in 1937 when Sid Richardson was driving Franklin Roosevelt up the island. Do you have buffalo now? We don't have buffalo. I didn't think so, but I thought I'd ask. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. We don't have buffalo. Yes, sir. What's the most interesting thing that's been washed up on the beach? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's there's a lot of categories in there. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I guess, the, I mean, we get some of everything washes up there. Uh, we've had a few people wash up there on dead and alive. Uh, you know, we've uh, we had probably the most interesting thing, though, I would say about the beach wash up was when Katrina hit um, over yonder. <clears throat> and it was amazing the because that tide got up so big that it completely when it even here that it completely. It washed all our debris up into the sand dunes, so the beach was cleaned off of all our stuff. So it was like only fresh stuff from Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a string of lightweight long furniture, plastic long furniture, and these plastic tubs like you get at Walmart with a snap lid on them. <laughs> Rubber made gray, like school trash cans, like you see in school. <laughs> I'm, I'm talking about for our 21 miles, just head to toe lined up. <laughs> <laughs> the darnest thing I've ever seen. But what was the, the neatest thing, there was a set of furniture, of outdoor furniture, <clears throat> that washed up from that, during that storm. I'm assuming it came from over there somewhere. And the four chairs, there was a wood table and wood chairs. The four chairs and the table were then 200 yards of each other on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> just come right in there together. And uh, I don't know, I just figured in all that bit of mess that they might have got separated more than four, more than 200 yards. One the day the cards on the table. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what do you use for water splash for the cattle? <clears throat> so the really unique thing about that out there, I'm glad you asked that. Our water, our water table today is about three feet below the surface out there. Um, our wells, like that windmill you saw, um, is that'd be about a 20 to 22 foot deep, basically just a joint pipe. is all it takes, um, and that water is exceptionally good water. I'm talking like water. It's just that lens of fresh water that lays on top of the salt water. It's basically rainwater. <clears throat> and that water is, uh, I mean, it's in most of those wells. I could pick a few wells, you can tell, but if I pick the right wells in the right areas, put it in an Ozark bottle and stuck it in your fridge, you wouldn't know the difference. I mean, I'm talking really good water. So we're blessed by that. You know, <clears throat> in the old days, I can only imagine it had to be interesting uh, for like Indians and whatnot. And you, I used to think, man, those boogers must have had a hard time if they were. Of course, they may not have been out there in the summertime. They may have just migrated there during the winter and whatnot. But <clears throat> in the summertime, most all our natural swells go dry, the natural little old ponds and things. Almost every mid-July through August, they're dry. So there's no surface water. And I always thought, how did anything, how did anything live out here? You know? But if you go into a natural swell, get right down in the bottom of a swell, generally, you could you could have took a stick. I mean, like I could, I wouldn't start water. You drop me off out there, I'm not gonna have to worry about water. Just kind of like elephants will do in these dry riverbeds in Africa. All you gotta do is get in a low spot and dig, and within 
six or eight inches, even if that swell is dry, you're going to find water in there. And all you got to do is just excavate, and it's just a natural spring of water will come in there. Matter of fact, I've, I've decreased the number of windmills and, and, and solar pumps that I've got scattered around the island because I can just go to some of these swales like that where it's a pond of water today. <clears throat> starts drying up in July or August, and I've got a few select ones, and all I've got to do is dig down three feet. And there's a natural little pond right there. It'll keep filling itself up. And you just let it do its thing. So it's it's actually it looks like it'd be scary, but it's actually really waters are really easy thing. So you got an excavator out there and you just dig those <clears throat> ponds. We've got we don't have an excavator. We use a, generally we don't dig very big ponds, they're small ones. We just got a backhoe that we'll use for any kind of little just little stuff. We don't have any big ponds out there. And, and none of that water is any brackish or anything. It's not so fresh. <clears throat> Only if you go below. If you go, if you were to drill a well below about 25 feet or so, six or seven feet, it'll get brackish. <clears throat> um, it's like over on the refuge years ago at the old uh, <clears throat> Wynn Murchison headquarters. There, they were going to want to put a new well in, and I had a relationship with those folks, and and they they asked me questions about it. <clears throat> And they said, well, we want, we want to get fresh water up here for our headquarters. What do we need to do? And I said, well, you just need to put you down a well about 20 foot deep. Oh, no, we need more volume than that. Mm -hmm. I said, well, what do you plan on doing? I said, we've got 20 people over here and cattle and stuff. Y'all just have two or three people over there at the time. I think the McAllister's were living over there. Mm -hmm. One or two other people coming and going. I said, what do y'all, y'all aren't even, we watered y'all. I mean, we have sprinkler systems and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we just need more volume. So then the, the water well guy they were going to have to do it came to me, and he asked me questions. And I said, man, just if they want more volume, put do like we've got five of them. You know, just put five shallow wells in there, two. Or, but they went ahead and went down to, I don't know, 100 feet or something, and it's salt water, you know. <laughs> put an RO system on it and that, you know. Anyway, government did it. And that's government management. We understand. Invasive plan. Do you have a problem with stuff coming in? <clears throat> we uh, we work really, really hard at trying not to let that happen. Um, we uh, right now the biggest thing that we battle on the day to day. So we check materials before we bring them to the island. We go check the, the yards they're on. You know, you can only check so much. But we check is whatever we can, anything that'll come to the island. Um, the, the couple of things we have problems with is guinea grass, um, which is getting to be a big problem everywhere. Um, and uh, we battle that. Uh, fortunately, the guinea grass doesn't just love it out in the open prairie. It likes to be under trees and shade a little bit more, or not far from it. So uh, we, we kind of got it hemmed up, but I mean, we're, we're fighting it hard. Uh, but you know what? Other than that, and then some... Uh, um, some Bermuda grass that was brought out there years and years ago. Uh, that's probably a native Bermuda, but I'm not a fan of Bermuda. Uh, I am on my cattle side, but not on the wildlife side. And so, uh, but no, no big, no big issues. But we work really hard at trying to, you know, make sure it doesn't happen. How do you control it? Just mainly, how do I control the guinea grass? Yeah, the guinea. What we're doing is we just spot treat it with Roundup. We've got it, it's not everywhere. I mean, if you just keep pounding it with Roundup and pounding it and pounding it and pounding it, you can get it knocked out. If you have a small enough area, you can manage it. And that's, oh, I don't know other than that. I, I don't know what you do. It's kind of lost cause, but you're pretty tough. What's the highest elevation in the island? What do you think, Terry? I don't know. The coordinates are the highest, and some of them get up 45 feet. I don't know where they are since Harvey, and but, uh, you know, that's, that's a unique location because we get tidal currents from the south and the north that come out of the rivers and they collide right there in front of San Jose and then deposits of sand and then so the dunes build. You can go to Galveston or you can go south either way and you won't see the, the tall port dunes. They're all dunes five or six foot tall. Right. It's a unique area out there. Yeah, yeah that's what... I mean, I could agree with 45. You know, I would have just said if you would have been here, I'd probably said 35 or 40. But that's just a guess. But pretty tall. Yeah. Wait, how many sets of pins do you have? <clears throat> we only have two sets of pins. Um, 
there uh, there used to be a set way up on the north end uh, where Mr. Russell, I'm sure he'll talk about that some up there where they lived for a while, but that was before my time. Uh, we just have two sets, uh, one's at our headquarters and one's about halfway up the aisle north of the headquarters, nothing south of the And so we just move cattle long distance to those pens when we need to. Yes. Do you have a bunkhouse and a mess hall for your work work units? <clears throat> we do. We have uh, several bunkhouses, um, and uh, we do have a, a ranch kitchen where all the employees come in. Cooks roll in in the morning. They uh, they make a quick breakfast. Uh, people do their chores, so to speak, and then run in and grab a taco or something real kind of fast, not a sit down piddle breakfast. And then they feed lunch to everybody, uh, and then they leave supper dinner to, to whoever's going to stay for the night. So it's kind of old ranch style like that. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have been either told or I've read that there were once big live oak trees on Matagorda and there were pirates there and they cut the trees down to get rid of the pirates. But given your experience on uh, San Jose, it doesn't sound like big trees would grow. You know, boy, I, so we even had a few live oak trees out there uh, during my time that were planted years ago, right around the headquarters that yeah. were planted there, not natural ones. Uh, I never saw any signs that would make me think that there were any big stands of live oaks out there now. If they were, I wonder what took them down, you know, because they would have been taken down over 100 years ago, I would say. I mean, what would a, unless a hurricane twisted them up into knots and then a horrendous fire came through there and burned up all the signs of them, I, I, I just kind of, I kind of doubt it. But what does it add to soil? Would, would, would the growth line with it? You know, I, I mean, the ones there at our headquarters, they grow well. I mean, that soil out there is not that much different than what you have here. I mean, it's sand, you know. Uh, the ones that are at our headquarters grow, um, I, I don't know. But I, I once again, I doubt my opinion is that our world is moving from a prairie. I mean, you know, I read a deal the other day where an explorer came from what was what's now Laredo, it wasn't even the name then, I don't believe, across to the Corpus area. And he said there wasn't, it was his notes, said there wasn't a tree in sight. They had a time finding firewood. They couldn't even find any firewood. And so I think we're headed in a direction of getting thicker with trees and brush and thicker with trees and brush. I just, I don't know. I have a hard time. But I, don't, I don't know. I just wouldn't think so if there was any trees. Is there any history of driving cattle across the bays or anything like that back and forth instead of barging them? I'm unaware of any history to San Jose Island that's going on. I'm unaware. Uh, now, I, uh, I could see where at a time cattle might have been driven on the, on the Matagorda. And then down Matagorda and on to San Jose at one time, but I'm unaware of anything. I don't reach that far back. <laughs> I hadn't even been told that far back. Yes, ma'am. Your one longhorn had a very unusual horn. Is that just that, or is there a special? No, there's so there's there's a bunch of different. Uh, there's a bunch of different horn types in longhorn. I've got several pictures in here. Uh, that particular one, which I'm sure I'm going the wrong way. Uh, that particular one is uh, a lot of people. There is a term, and, and I wish I had my my longhorn compadre here. He can talk the horn types. Uh, that's a very very unique longhorn right there. You don't. This that's what you mean. This one's got a twist in it, you know. Um, they call that the Texas twist. A lot of a lot of people will call it. But boy, to have like a double twist or trying to be a triple twist or whatever, um, that one is really, really, really unique. But they have there's terms for each and every horn type. I'm not I'm not good at it. You know, like here's a you know, there's another style, you know. That one they just they kinda go forward and they got a bend to them, but then they go up. Well, there's a bunch of different styles of them. And I don't, to be honest with you, there is, they are heritable to some degree. So, you know, if you want to try to get more twist, you breed a cow with a bull with a twist, and they, you know, supposedly there's a, there's a means and a method. So, how many calves do you normally have in a year? 
So our situation is um, all these cattle you see in this photograph, for instance, and the vast majority out there are steers. They're not cattle. We have, we, have, we have a small cow herd as well. But uh, once again, to not get too labor intensive like she was talking about, um, asking questions about you know, the money and get, how why would you do that, go into that much trouble. If you run steers, there's not as much profit involved, um, especially when you let them get old or aged like we do. But you don't have to take care of having calves farm, having pulling calves off twice a year, and you know, whatever, all that kind of stuff that goes on with raising calves, you don't have to put that much effort in. So these steers, you can throw them out there. What we do is we typically will buy steers that are, that are Six, seven hundred, eight hundred pounds, and we'll throw them out there and let them graze. And the reality of it is, we don't get our best out of them until they get big and heavy. Remember, I was talking about them walking and tromping and you know, hoof acts and stirring up the ground. They really start, you really start getting your money out of them when they get on up about a thousand, twelve hundred pounds. And so, I like to keep them for till they're eight or nine years old before I'm going to sell them. And some of them sometimes older than that. There's this old steer right here. He's probably 18 or something. something like that. So it's not, it's not a beef operation. No, no. It's a it's it's for the wildlife. I mean, that's that's the reason that we that's the reason they're there. Wow. So how many longhorns versus how many standing troops? You know, there's probably oh, there's more standing troops than longhorns. Probably around uh, I'd say right now there's about 1,500 head out there and. 350 of them are longhorns, maybe 400. But they're they're just uh, ornaments. They're, the cattle are not really a property center. They are, well, obviously we sell them and we do make money. But, and they help offset all our costs of, what, of doing the business that we're doing out there. But, the, but the, the biggest goal, the reason for having there going all that trouble is to try to manage that range of property. Yes, sir. You started off talking today about your goal managing the bigger ranch. I'm guessing what you told us today, you found that. Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I'm, I'm one of the people, I guess, in the world who can say, you know what, I, I'm doing what I dreamed of doing when I was 10 years old. You know, that's always been what I wanted to do, so, except for throwing in the island part of it. <laughs> do you live on the island? So I've got a home out there, uh -huh. uh, but I've got one on the mainland boat, so it kind of depends on what's going on. And, where I'm at. Yeah. Uh, do you ever collaborate with the King Ranch on any of your work? Um, not any more than, I mean, I know folks down there. We've traded cattle. Some of the steers in this photograph could likely be some King Ranch cattle, but not nothing more than just a little you know, distant business relationship, you know, like time, not, not regular.